Good evening and welcome to um, the third installment in our lecture series, Never Too Old to Be Seen, Aging and Gender in the European Cinema. Um, and uh, once again, you have to do with two guys um, speaking. We'll change that next time. Um, but one, again, the focus is on also on male performances and aging in relation uh, to gender. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Alexandre Moussa, who holds PhD in cinema studies from the Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. Um, he is a world specialist on, of, on one of the greatest actresses, to my mind, in cinema, period. But certainly uh, uh, one of the most important actresses in feminist cinema because Delphine Seri, who is the focus of a thesis, was uh, the protagonist of uh, Jean Guillemin, um, the Chantal Ackermann film, which, as some of you may know, has recently been voted in the BFI poll of the best films of all time, the best film of all time, displacing Vertigo uh, from the top position uh, after, after 10 years. Um, I have told you before that our research team is composed uh, of people postdoc researchers who bring a lot of previous experience to the project and who actually have a professional background in uh, cinema. And if you just read the little bio that you find in this wonderful perspective, uh, Alexandre has been um, uh, modest enough to focus on his academic achievements, uh, which includes uh, currently teaching engagements at the University of Poitiers and on his current curatorial work and uh, work as a screenwriter and film programmer, film curator and director. But um, Alexandre had a previous life as an economist, as someone with a business degree, yes. let's say. <laughs> so with, uh, with background in business and the background in film production. Um, so he's once again one of those people whose calls will be answered when they're placed at production houses, which is important um, for our project. But tonight, um, our focus is on um, Alexandre's uh, primary qualities as a scholar, as a uh, film scholar working on uh, gender and performance in particular. And his speech tonight is entitled Acting Old aging as screen performance, and it's about the question of the difference between screen age and biological and cultural age. And with that, Alexandre, I cede the podium to you. Welcome and thanks for coming to us. Uh, thank you very much, Vincent, for this presentation. Thank you, Simon uh, and uh, Olena, for allowing uh, me to come here and hope I'm sorry. Um, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me if you have trouble understanding my Madman French accent. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I guess I will start. Uh, I guess maybe my presentation is a bit long, but I've, um, I've prepared like, some quite long extracts, so in case we get a bit late, uh, I will cut an extract. We can still talk about the films afterwards, or I can give you a file of the film if you want, so if you are curious, we can talk about it afterwards. So I just wanted to uh, begin the presentation with a little scare. I'm going to show you a, a bit of a scary scene. how this idea got into my head. So at the end of last year, uh, at the moment when I was interviewed uh, to join the HD project, I happened to watch this uh, American horror movie called X. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, so it's the first part of a trilogy directed by Ty West and starring British racing star Mia Goss. Uh, so X is about um, the cast and crew of a porno uh, film who rents a house located on a, on a Texas farm a farm owned by an elderly couple, and of course this elderly couple turns out to be all these uh, homicidal maniacs who attack uh, the, the, the film crew. And so what's interesting about the film is that Mia Goss is in fact cast in a double role, 
because she plays both the main protagonist, who is a porn actress uh, called Maxine, and one of the film's antagonists, an aging farmer called Pearl. And I was particularly struck by this very obsessing scene that uh, happens quite late in the film. Uh, before, we have seen Pearl expressing envy over Maxine's youth, making sexual advances towards her. And uh, later, she climbs naked into her bed and begins caressing her uh, until she wakes up and realizes in horror what is going on. So, many aspects of X are interesting uh, in regards to old age. For instance, um, I think that the film has an interesting um, and perceived for the Pearl character, for her loneliness, for her first revealed lust. Uh, but it also reiterates several negative stereotypes associated with aging. For instance, uh, it tends to portray old age as physical and cognitive uh, decline. Uh, it's associated with conservatism, with political uh, and religious fundament fundamentalism, sorry. And it anticipates a young audience disgust for an aging female body, as you could see uh, here, depicted as monstrous. So the idea of casting a uh, seemingly inoffensive old crone uh, in the part of the monster is in, in set not very uh, new. I guess uh, if you've seen um, Snow White and the Seven Wolves, or if you've seen maybe the exploitation pictures of the, the end of the Hollywood era, for instance, whatever happened to Amy Jane with um, Betty Davis and John Crawford. Uh, you have seen this figure before, but what I find interesting here is the fact that the young beauty and the old crone are played by the same actress. So we are watching a young and desirable movie star of today being stroked by her aging self, no longer young and desirable, no need to be seen, no need to be touched. That's some kind of grotesque uh, sense of mise en abyme here. Uh, it is grotesque because, of course, of the blood that she has on uh, her hand because of the montage, uh, the editing of the sequence that's very humorous. Uh, also, in the sense that there is this very heavy makeup used to age the actress, and while it's convincing enough to make her pass as an elderly woman throughout the film, I guess you all agree with me that. It also makes it impossible to forget that she is in fact not an elderly woman. And it really carries this uncanny feeling of recognizing a familiar figure while sensing that it is not what it pretends to be. Uh, I don't know, like, like um, I could say that her inside doesn't match her outside. She's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, and nevertheless, there is this grotesque aspect uh, of the performance, but it doesn't um, really annihilate uh, the sense of tragedy of seeing a young star being um, stroked or groped uh, by her horrible destiny. It's interesting that for playing this part of Pearl, Mia Goss received uh, very high praise from critics and audiences alike, both for her willingness to spend 10 hours a day in a makeup booth. Uh, and also for having the acting chops, of course, to pull off this double performance in the film. But if we imagine this young actress approaching the actual age of the character of Pearl, not only is it highly unlikely that she will still be cast in leading parts, it is also probable that if she is still is, she would be reluctant to accept a role that exploits her aging body in such a gruesome way and depicts her as a monster. So one could argue that it is the very fact that her performance cannot be perceived as anything else than a performance that makes it possible for the British star to accept such a part. When you are young, acting old pays. When you are older, well, not so much. So this scene, um, I think it exemplifies uh, several of the paradoxes that lie uh, at the heart of those prosthetics or CGI-assisted performances. Um, in their essay Fade to Grey, Aging in American Cinema, Timothy, Sherry, and Nancy McVitie call them Greyface. Uh, and of course, they are not limited to the horror genre. Uh, you often find them in biopic, and they have been used as well in mainstream uh, comedies, art house dramas alike. Um, what's interesting about those performances is that so far, the literature about aging and cinema, they um, have been 
quite criticized. Especially if you read, there's a very interesting chapter at the end of uh, Josephine Dolan's uh, book essay, Contemporary Cinema and Old Age. Uh, the chapter is called Silvering Abjection, sorry, at the gender prosthetics of the fourth century imaginary. Um, and Dolan is, in fact, uh, quite critical of those performances, as, according to her, they are often used to strengthen a fourth stage imaginary that associates old age with social and personal ways, and, uh, as often, uh, this association um, is made with femininity. Uh, the grotesque abjection of feminine decay uh, tends to be portrayed in those films while masculine decay is never really showed apart from the scene that comes in several comedies about erectile dysfunction and of course erectile dysfunction you don't really show on screen you just talk about it whereas when old women are prosthetically aged you, saw, you see that decay on screen so um, I do agree with both uh, Dolan's points, but I also believe that those performances of old age are more ambivalent uh, than they seem to be at first sight. Um, of course, uh, it's true that by many aspects they tend to reinforce this narrative of decline uh, described by Margaret Hewlett in her book essay Declining to Decline, in the sense that they tend to portray aging as a decline from the peak of youth. They insist on spectacular, uh, spectacular sorry, signs of physical decay. But at the same time, while they do insist on this biological aspect of the aging process, they are often excessive, uh, ostensibly artificial nature, nature sorry, also tends to expose the performativity of age and shows it also as a social uh, construct, something that can be eliminated through the use of prosthetics, of costume, of um, uh, gestures, uh, and attitudes that can be duplicated to appear younger or older. So, uh, before going on with my presentation, I, I wanted to fit this argument I just made by bringing your attention to four tensions or contradictions uh, inherent to those performances of old age that I've already touched uh, upon while discussing this bed sequence in X. So, the first one is the contradiction between authenticity and artificiality. So, as you have seen, and I, I will discuss it, um, there's really a stark contrast between the way those performances are designed. If you take a look at the, like the, the makeup artist's books or the comments of the performers, they always insist on their ambition of realism uh, that's really at the root of their work. Uh, makeup artists, costume designers, actors uh, really feel like they are doing a realistic job. And of course, when you see those performances, they have this artificiality in their final results um, that precisely never fully manages to hide the work that was at the origin of this construction. So that's something that I find interesting. And it's only because we were discussing it uh, right now about the film that we just screened in the other room. Like, as well as a performer acts, in those kind of uh, performances, you can never forget that it's still not an aging person doing it. Second contradiction, it stems from the first one, um, between character and performer. So, because of this aforementioned artificiality of those performances, um, it tends to uh, suggest a discrepancy between the grotesque external appearance of the body and the person inhabiting it. Therefore, as an audience, you are alerted of the presence of the performer hiding behind the mask of the character. You can never totally forget that someone is there playing the role. I guess third tension, the one that is more the most important, I guess, because it's the root of it's the reason why we use this kind of performances. It's the tension between an older and a younger self. So the artificially aged body of the actor uh, in those films is almost always confronted with its authentic or at least recognizably younger uh, self within the film text. And so when you have this co-presence in the same film or even in the, the case we saw in the same shots um, of an aging body and its younger incarnation, it has interesting and ambiguous effects. So on the one side, 
there's this radical physical contrast between both incarnations, so it tends to present uh, old age as a distinct period of life radically separate from youth. And at the same time, because you see it also this gravitate within the film text, it also highlights the continuity between the young self and the old one. And it's basically the idea of casting, instead of casting another actor to play the aging part, if you choose uh, to have the same person do it, it's because you, you want to keep some kind of continuity between them. Um, and fourth tension that's external to the film text, between artistic recognition and threats to the star image. Um, so that's an article I read uh, to prepare this paper that I recommend to you. It's in, uh, from Anne Murray. It's called Grotesquery as Marker of Success in Aging Female Stars. And it discusses the high exploitation films that I uh, talked about earlier. And according to her, uh, those great face uh, performances, they are as much an opportunity as they are a threat for the actors, and especially the actresses between them. Uh, because while they are often synonymous with critical recognition of the performance acting abilities and complete dedication to their craft, they also tend to threaten the star's image by associating them with aging and physical decay. So Moray and Dolan, after her, argue that if those performances are so grotesque, it's also because the grotesque serves as a way of signaling them as impersonation and not personification. Uh, it's a way to protect the star, uh, especially if she's a woman older 40, like because you show so much that this is not you, that you are acting, you are protected from being associated with old age. And uh, if you see, for example, the performances of Meryl Streep uh, in August or Sage County or The Iron Lady, she overplays this uh, state of decay as also to distinguish herself from uh, this uh, advanced stage of aging. So, uh, I'd like to elaborate on all those uh, ideas in two steps. First, I just uh, start to discuss the exact ways one acts old, so I will be talking about the practical aspects of those transformations how makeup, costume, hairstyle, prosthetics are used in order to make actors and actresses look older, uh, and what also are the biases and the limits of those practices. And later, I'd like to walk you through four examples, I hope we have time for all that, uh, of great face performances um, with different uh, uh, effects, and we'll discuss what kind of narrative and visual frameworks allow those performances to be believable and what perception of old age uh, they tend to build. So, first thing first, uh, before diving into those examples, I just wanted to introduce you or to remind you of different tools that I usually use in films uh, in order to artificially age actors. Of course, they are not mutually exclusive, they are often used together uh, and they, um, yeah, they tend to work uh, together. And um, just to make you understand a little bit the logic behind those transformations, uh, I took a look at several makeup handbooks uh, explaining methods used by professionals and um, uh, I guess in the later part of the project we'll have the chance to actually interview um, makeup artists uh, to know how they work, but it's like, it was like a, a first step for this presentation. And what I found interesting is that they were often based on medical assessments of physical changes occurring during an old age. For example, uh, Dominique de Vorge, which is like the author of the main uh, makeup bible for French uh, film, she lists the uh, symptoms of biological aging that are the roots of the alterations she suggests to make. So I, I will read you as it's used that the oval of the face collapses, wrinkles appear on the forehead and the external corners of the eyes and mouth, temples sink, eye bags and pouches appear, Eyelids wrinkle and soon fall on the eye, cheeks hollow or collapse, the nasal level falls, uh, appears and deepens, the lips narrow down, the neck wrinkles and freeze. You can't wait to be there. Um, it's like, uh, it's very interesting because um, in all the manuals, those um, medical facts are the basis of the way they design the makeup, and I think that's bias in there, that's quite interesting. So, um, I, I will be fast, like uh, explaining 
what you can do if you want to do it yourself. Uh, so, um, makeup uh, is used, a lot of aging effects, especially if you are aiming for moderate alterations of the face, can be achieved using simple grease paints. So you can age the eyes and eyelids, you can puff out or sink the cheeks, sink the temples, you can make the lips uh, thinner and paler, you can uh, make the eyebrows whiter. Uh, it's a way that you can pay often. Um, if you take a look at those performances, they often um, have makeup on the face and uh, the hands, and often they paint veins, they paint brown uh, spots on the skin. Um, uh, they add chin or forehead uh, wrinkles, everything uh, can be done by makeup and of course um, can, uh, the, the, the makeup work can be highlighted to proper lighting uh, to make it seem more realistic. Uh, the interesting uh, important part is of course uh, the use of prosthetics. Uh, so in order to indicate wrinkles around the eyes and mouth, you have this thin uh, rubber or plastic substance that's known as tipo. Uh, that you apply in very small quantities around the eye or around the mouth and you, it, it uh, really has these wrinkly effects that you can use in a very easy way to create moderate um, uh, aging. If you want to go more spectacular, uh, you can mold artificial pieces uh, to fit uh, specific areas of the face. Uh, you make them out of liquid latex or rubber foam and they are quite rigid, so they tend to limit the flexibility of the actor. For example, for the La Vie en Rose in good English, uh, that we will talk about later, the makeup artist refused to use them because uh, the Marion Cotillard needed to sing and to, be, to have uh, her mouth to be uh, like she needed to be more expressive, so he, he couldn't just put parts of Edith Piaf's face all over her face. And he uh, used um, latex. Um, uh, pieces of the latex, latex uh, stripes that were applied slowly and in a specific order on the face, so that's a certain method. It's very interesting when you read those makeup manuals because they explain that you cannot put the latex in any order if you want to achieve like um, uh, realistic wrink uh, wrinkles. You have really to put all the those uh, those uh, rubbers, uh, those uh, things in place in a very specific order. So, um, of course, now uh, CGI is more and more used, so co computer assisted imagery since the second half of the 2000s. Uh, digital effects have been uh, used more and more to age or de age. It's funny because when you look for information on aging, you find a lot of information on de aging. Uh, and so, um, the, although they seem dominant now, they have not really replaced the traditional methods and often films combine the two perspectives. For example, uh, if you've seen like the um, Avengers Endgame, you know, the Chris Evans is uh, aged uh, very much, and uh, it was part prosthetics on the, um, on the sets and part post-production. And if you see, there's very interesting analysis of the Jenny Button by Josephine Dolan at the end of her book. Uh, she notices that in the film, you use like the best technology in order to make Brad Pitt look younger, and <laughs> you use like the old school prosthetics to make Kate Blanchett look older, and that's like the, the logic of the film. It's quite interesting. Um, then her style. So as aging occurs, of course, uh, hair gets grayer, thinner, and the hairline tends to recede. Uh, sometimes due to balding. So in the first stages of uh, uh, age, you can use hairspray, grease paint, or a professional dye. It's enough to cover, uh, to suggest those early uh, stages of aging. But if you want to go for old age transformation, uh, you often use bold caps uh, made of latex to cover the head. And after that, you have a layer of thinning hair. So that's what they did with Maria Lucia, we'll talk about it later. It's like she has a fake um, skull. And then you add those sitting, disgusting, like, moves on the top of the head. And costume, and, uh, you see, I, I just pulled the delfin ceiling out of my hat. I, I try to do it every time I'm giving a talk somewhere. Uh, so, it's, a costume is very interesting, and it's more, I've talked about all the obvious, very, um, uh, 
uh, strong ways of making a person age, but costume is actually one of the most efficient ways to suggest an alteration of the body. Um, so, of course, costume guarantees some sort of very similitude of age and aging. Uh, they are used as a visual signifier uh, to old fashionedness, like old people in the film dress like crap, and that's how we know they're old. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, also, you have to remember that it's always a way to alter body shape, to alter movements, um, and uh, again, in Josephine Dolan's book, you have a very good analysis of the um, costumes worn by Meryl Streep in The Iron Lady, and uh, as she moves from being a woman of power with colorful um, professional costumes to uh, being like a crazy old lady with dementia, like suddenly she wears like those um, clothes that are too big for her and make her seem very frail uh, and that are very um, uh, like uh, very grey, very beige, like in a, in a color palette that's really uh, less flamboyant than when she's a woman of power. So costume can really be used in that way. I took this example, wonderful film, best film ever, you have to see. Uh, Muriel of the time of return of uh, Anna Hene, so they at the time uh, she was 30 years old. Uh, and she was supposed to play the part of a woman age 45, and so uh, most of it comes, like there's a, a wig of grey hair, but apart from that, it's all the costume. And throughout the film, you can see that she wears like a print uh, ensemble comprising a long skirt and a jacket. The cut of the clothing, the fabric are very old-fashioned. Uh, as are, uh, you can see here that she has a kind of a disgusting brown shirt uh, with like uh, this um, necklace of fake plastic black pearls. Um, uh, she wears dark stockings, flat shoes, uh, that's also um, uh, changed from the, the previous thing she done where she had like uh, those high heels that gave her a completely different uh, walk. Uh, and what's, um, it was, what I was telling before is that both the skirts and the jackets are slightly oversized and the jackets have um, like uh, shoulder patches on them, so to make her silhouette more heavy. Um, and uh, so it's, it's really about masking a young actress silhouette to make her, like, to, to bring a sense of happiness to her whole body. To give you an idea of how costume uh, can be important because it doesn't seem to be the most spectacular way to age someone and in fact it's some, sometimes the most efficient. And finally, of course, accessories such as tinted lenses as I paint the, the white of the eye yellow that were missed by Olena in the, in the Guy uh, film. Uh, you have uh, glasses, dentures, earring aids, walking sticks, medical waders, everything that an actor can use to mimic um, uh, the, 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 the difficulties associated with old age. And finally, of course, there's performance itself. Uh, apart from all those prosthetic technologies can, that can help the actor achieve uh, uh, this uh, old uh, age appearance, age can be performed through different gestures, both postures, or the alteration that are accomplished really by the actors themselves. What they can do, for instance, includes weight gain or weight loss, as the silhouette tends to change with old age, and for example, uh, Every time you read interviews of actors preparing for such a part, like, it's like, it's like, it's like I gained 10 pounds for the part, yeah, to, to a year old. Um, posture is very important, so actors tend to bend onwards uh, to suggest the degradation of vertebra, uh, uh, discs and muscles. In Guy, you can see another strategy that we'll discuss later, like he's very he doesn't really move his torso, so you, like, when he's on stage, he's, like, you, you see that there's a fixity there that proves that the actor cannot move, and it's really like the, the way he holds his body that makes you understand that. Uh, the walk, of course, um, the, the, the gait, like the, the actor can mean difficulties to walk, walking with both legs, dragging their feet, leaping, uh, everything that suggests uh, disability. Um, 
as fast gestures ago, uh, movements are performed at a slower place, sorry, pace with more rigidity, uh, often imitating the impact of arthritis uh, on joints, the loss of muscular uh, mass, and so on. And um, I guess uh, something that, again, is maybe the most important thing, or at least the one that is uh, most often used, is the voice saturation. And then I would recommend another interesting article um, in the book called Staging Age, the Performance of Age in Theatre, Dance and Film. And it describes the characteristics we often associate to age voices, lower vocal pitch, increased hoarseness, increased strain, higher incidence of voice breaks, uh, vocal tremor, breeziness, uh, reduced loudness, uh, so a speech rate, hesitancy, you see all this in the, the, the performance that we are going to talk later. So, I was very fast. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit expensive. Um, but just a, a few remarks on those practices I described uh, in a very broad way. Um, I guess, like, one thing that I noticed, I think it's very interesting because despite or because the scientific uh, background that informs them, those practices often tend to present an homogenized image of old age because they focus on displaying visible signs of biological aging. Of course it makes sense because film is a visual art, uh, but often and the problem is that these uh, creations are underpinned by the perception of aging as physical decline and loss of abilities. And it's very interesting to read how the makeup artists describe old age in their books. Uh, for example, uh, Raiko Kruk writes, Aging is a mandatory path leading to the last stop that's called death. <laughs> well, uh, Herman Buchmann explains, aging is actually a progressive decline of that extraordinary machine, the human body. Uh, the body experiences a number of losses. So, I guess this double bias, like emphasis on the visible and perception of the old age as decline, explain why those artificial depictions of old age often tend to exaggerate uh, the physical decay occasioned by the aging process. Um, uh, it's, like, it's very funny, I don't know how you feel, like uh, some, like very sleep, being 80, seems older on screen than my grandfather who is 95. I, I wish I put like, a picture to prove it, but like, uh, especially the insistence on heavy drinking. Like, uh, my grandfather has n not so many wrinkles. But uh, you see, because you list all these to-do lists of what happens when you age, you tend to accumulate them on one single body, when in fact, uh, often people don't have the whole uh, how can I say? <laughs> like the, 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 the whole lot of aging symptoms uh, written on the body. So I, I find it quite interesting. Another uh, thing that I find frankly hilarious, all those techniques that I um, talked about, that I used to latent the effects in order to age actors, they are exactly the same techniques that are used by stars and people in general in order to make themselves younger. So it, it's really because in the manuals, often you have like how to make someone look young, how to make someone look old, like the, the, the chapters are right next to each other. And makeup, hairstyling, choice of clothing, use of prosthetic uh, teeth or like uh, cosmetic uh, surgeries, adding plastic inside your body. Uh, it's like latex on the, the top of the skin. And you see it's very interesting because in some way, all this complicated process uh, to age someone, someone mirrors all the, uh, the complicated process that most people use to appear younger. And of course there's a real paradox at play here, because what we ask from aging stars, and especially female stars, is what uh, Joseph and Dolan puts as simultaneously achieve the artifice of rejuvenation and conceal the signs of its efforts, which means that the, to be conformed to this idea of successful aging, by maintaining a young appearance, but you should do it in an effortless way. You shouldn't look like you have tried too hard to become young. And you see, I, I think it's really interesting that we reward younger actors for performing the artifice of prosthetic aging uh, by 
the same those sides of spectacular decay, while we chastise actresses when, for example, they have the Botox done to appear younger. Uh, like, I, I think there's a paradox here that's quite interesting. And it's, it goes back to what I was saying before, that acting old plays when you are young. If you are actress looking old, it's hard to find parts. And if you are an actress who tries too hard to look young, it's the same. Anyway. And finally, what's interesting when you read all those manuals, um, those makeup books, uh, you have a lot of warnings from the makeup artists to, the, uh, to their students explaining that the aging makeup process can be very difficult psychologically for the actors and especially the actresses. It's very interesting that in the Dominique de Vorge book I, I mentioned, there's like a step-by-step -step procedures for uh, latex application uh, how to do it without scaring the model? Like, uh, and you have to, to explain every step uh, that you do, show her, like, try a little bit on her skin, so that she can still uh, drink uh, or uh, do stuff. And um, uh, Reiko Krug, that I mentioned earlier, she's like a Japanese makeup artist that's really famous and has done a lot of special effects work for stage and film. Uh, she uh, speaks. Um, like she says that actors, and especially actresses above 40, when you try to apply um, aging makeup on them, they turn into demons that say no, uh, because they are scared to watch their future selves uh, in the mirror. And it's quite sad. like she says, like for example, the, the Nicole Garcia comes to her and says, like, Oh, uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. The, the prosthetics, it just doesn't stick. It just fell out, so maybe I should do the scene like, without it. <laughs> and uh, it's like, um, it's really interesting, all those anecdotes, because they kind of prove the point that I was making earlier, that acting old can somehow strengthen the integrity of the star image. And like those actresses, they don't want to look at their aging selves, the, the way the poor Miyagos screamed uh, in the sequence we watched earlier. Uh, so, uh, now we, we know a little bit about those techniques. I wanted to take a closer way at the way four European films uh, from the last two decades use those gray face performances uh, to understand how they work or do not work and what they tell us uh, about old age. So, I will start discussing two biopics directed by Olivier Daron. So, La Môme in French and La Vie en Rose in Good English. Uh, starring Manu Cotillard as uh, Edith Piaf. Uh, and a more recent film called Simon, Woman of the Century, I don't know if it was released in Germany. Uh, starring Elsa Zibberstein as Holocaust survivor turned politician Simon Veil. Uh, I picked those two films because they are a good example of the dominant way that those aging performances are conceived and framed within most films as the final step uh, on the path which brings the character from the cradle to the grave. And then I will, you, I will talk about two more peculiar uses of those performances. The first one is another French film, so it's a, a guy, uh, mockumentary about a fake aging singer that was shown uh, right before this uh, talk. And I had to pick a British film because I found no equivalents uh, so far in, uh, in French cinema. It's uh, Joanna House, The Eternal Daughter, uh, that was released on screens earlier this year. I don't know if you, any of you have seen it. Uh, so it stars Tilda Swinton uh, in the double role of a mother and daughter. Um, I'm really hesitating about. Uh, have you what seen uh, La Mouma, La Vie en Rose, no one? I'm not going to show you the, the whole scene, I just wanted you to see how the, how the scenes go from one to another, and I will just show you. Uh, for Simon, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the uh, English subtitles, so I, I think I put French subtitles for now. The, the, what she says doesn't really matter to me. It's the way, once again, that uh, the presence of the older character is uh, built in the film that I find interesting. Okay. I, 
I won't uh, go further. Uh, I've shown you longer extracts, but if I want to, to tell you anything I want to say, uh, uh, I need to be short. What I wanted to show you through those uh, quick extracts is that those films, although they are quite different, um, like they share the same director, but they also share the same narrative structure. Uh, in which you have the life of two key French figures of the 20th century told in chronological disorder, blending episodes coming from various uh, periods of their lives. And uh, of course the films are different because the, the figures that those films talk about are very different. So Le La Vie en Rose tells the story of Edith Piaf, who was a popular singer, uh, who achieved worldwide success but also had like a miserable childhood and went through terrible personal turmoil, uh, addiction issues that led to her premature death. And Simone, um, Simone Woman of the Century, sorry, is about Simone Veil, who was a Jewish politician who survived uh, uh, the Holocaust, where she lost most of her family, and later became a prominent magistrate, uh, an advocate for women's rights. She was the health minister who passed the, the law legalizing uh, abortion in France, and later she became uh, the, the first female president of the European Parliament. She was a member of the Constitutional Council, she was a member of the French Academy. So you see it's like really two totally different paths, one very tragic and the other one uh, uh, growing from tragedy to success. Uh, and so the, the film aesthetics reflect their subject matter. La Vie en Rose is a garish musical melodrama whose excess matches uh, its central uh, bigger than life uh, figure, while Simone opts for a more realistic, tasteful style that is appropriate for a uh, historical drama on a serious uh, subject matter. And both films end with the revelation of the central trauma guiding the actions of their heroines, which are in the past the loss of a daughter in the case of Piaf, and the loss of a mother and the Holocaust uh, in the case of Bay. What's interesting in both films, the time of old age is the time in the characters' lives when everything has already happened. Uh, it's a time of looking back, it's the point from which the flow of memories will unfold. And so, for example, La Vie en Rose opens with a performance of Piaf that ends with her collaps uh, collapsing on stage. And as we see her lying on the floor, we hear her whispering voiceover, Saint Teresa, my sweet Jesus, don't abandon me, I want to go on living. Uh, and from there, we are taken back to her childhood. And at the end of the film, you have shots of Piaf on her deathbed, followed by her performance of a signature song, Non je ne reviens rien. And you have those uh, intertwined happy images from her past, portraits of the people she loved. And that this opening and ending in the film suggests that the whole film is the equivalent of a life flashing uh, in front of someone's eyes before they die. Simone, as you have seen, is similarly framed. Uh, with repeated scenes in which they, uh, while resting at her family house with her husband, children and grandchildren, dives into her memories as she is working on her memoirs. Uh, and so uh, you see her writing, staring at the, the air with a very serious uh, face. Um, uh, so you see, like, those aging sequences are only there to allow the past to come back. They have no real uh, interest of their own. And um, what I find also rather perplexing in both cases is that the transformation is not really convincing as the actress's uh, traits remain recognizable under the prosthetics and heavy makeup. Um, so uh, it feels like the film is gesturing towards the resemblance with the, the figure without erasing totally the sense uh, that the performer is at. So it comes back to the discourse world between authenticity and artificiality that I mentioned. Apart from those uh, common traits, the both films and performances suggest two very di different discourses on aging in resonance with the destiny of those two very different uh, women. So La Vie en Rose, interestingly, doesn't portray old age as decline, it portrays decline as old age, because you have to know that Edith Piaf actually died at 47 year old. Uh, yeah, at, uh, at 47. And so, like, she had those repeated health problems, uh, worsened or caused by her addiction to alcohol and uh, morphine, that 
this age of what you can actually in a secular way, spectacular way, sorry. And um, it's interesting because the makeup artist, uh, in interviews at the release of the film, he explains that of course he didn't mean to portray Piaf as an old woman because she was not an old woman, she was a woman with an addiction, with damages to her body, but she was not actually old. Uh, and that it was really all about saying the physical degradation um, caused by the excess of drugs. But what we see on screen is really a old woman. And then you see that Cotilla uh, wears this fake skull uh, with this layer of fake thin red hair. Uh, she has those lenses stained in yellow with uh, like the, the blood veins uh, drawn in them. False teeth. Uh, veins have been painted on her hands. Uh, there's a prosthesis that suggests double chin. Um, her eyebrows are shaved. Uh, her half closed eyes are buried under heavy eyelids and bats under them. And when you reach this stage at the end of the film, you can see that she has a goiter and she has those very uh, deep wrinkles uh, on her forehead. Um, uh, and it was funny at this stage that they, they carry her uh, to bed and she even says that she starts to display signs of dementia. So she really has all the symptoms uh, of old age. Uh, it's quite interesting. And what's more interesting is that Cotilla. Uh, like she gives this performance a very impressive physicality. Uh, so she says that she has learned to compress the vertebra in order to appear smaller through the whole film. And um, so you, you can see that she buries her chin deep into her neck. She blinks as if she has trouble opening her eyes. She marks every step as if it's causing her pain. You see that she has this uh, rigid arm with the, the, the fist uh, deformed, uh, suggesting um, the revenges of uh, arthritis, and she mimics also often a tremor in the hands. Uh, sometimes she tries to grab stuff and she, she, she breaks them. She has a low voice, breezy, raspier. Everything in her appearance and behavior reminds us of old age, and it's really a suggestion that chronological and biological age are not in sync, and here, Pierre's premature aging is shown as a price to pay for a life of excess and guilt over the death of her daughter that she didn't take care of enough because she was busy being a successful singer. So that's what she gets. Be careful. Um, so if you compare with uh, Cotillard's spectacular performance of physical decay, Elsa Silberstein appears a little bit tame, which is understandable given that all the events uh, depicted in the film happened prior to veil uh, withdrawal from the public eye. She was later, uh, during the five years of her life, she was diminished physically and mentally, but the film takes place before that. So we don't see the decline of Simon Veil through her performance. Uh, you see that efforts have been made in order to convey her aging, but they are more realistic and less showy uh, than Cotillard's makeup in La Vie en Rose. So you see that you have some, uh, the. the it's not, très, the, it's not uh, very easy to see. Uh, sorry, but they were not really good. Uh, shots, but uh, she has those um, brown spots uh, on her skin, bags under her eyes, the cheeks and chin are sinking, you have wrinkles added under her nose, and you have this impressive turkey neck uh, prosthetics uh, that suggest uh, her aging. But you can see that her hair is intact, her features are not deformed, and nothing in her posture suggests disability. She walks without much difficulty, she holds herself uh, upright, and she's shown sitting down. Uh, um, in La uh, Vie Rose, she has, uh, in all those aging sequences, she's always lying down or going to lie down. Um, so um, it's very surprising because uh, Silverstein not, does not always imitate Simon Veil. Sometimes she speaks like her, sometimes she does not. So it creates some kind of a very strange effects. But uh, when Down shows us Edith Piaf, he shows her behind the scenes, wearing rags, uh, devastated. Simon Veil, he films her with her family, like uh, not being a politician, but she is dressed in those scenes as she was dressed 
eat, drink her politic, like her public appearances. So you see uh, her uh, pretty floral ensembles, the lapis earrings that she was famous for. She wears them even in her private life in Islam. And so you see that none of the aging adjustments intend to strip the character of its dignity and the first time uh, performance of for sobriety. But that is also because she has nothing much to act in those scenes. Uh, the scenes in which she is depicted using during old age, she is sitting or walking, she is lost in her memories, she writes two or three things in her, uh, in her handbook. Uh, but uh, nothing more, and the, the scene seemed to have no other purpose than providing a narrative anchor for uh, the disadvantage of memories. And so we only understand why she's there at the very end of the film, uh, in which we see Simone Veil visiting the concentration camp where she was deported with her mother and sister. We see her also standing in front of the wall of uh, names of the Jews deported. Uh, from France during World War II. And you have this voiceover in which sometimes it seems like Simone Veil, sometimes it seems like Elsa's first um, explaining the difference between memory and history, the threats of the disappearance of the witnesses and victims of the Holocaust uh, for the recognition of the tragedy. And so you see that by bringing the familiar image of Veil's aging body and voice back to life, the film intends to revive uh, through her the memory of all the tragedies and political fights that her name was associated uh, with. Once also reminding us of the fragility of the collective memory uh, once individuals that make it are gone. So it's the Elsa Silverstein is soberly aged and performs uh, soberly because she allows this memory to take center stage while preserving the dignity of Simone Veil, uh, of the woman who embodied them. It's like the, the age Simone Veil in the film is not really a character, it's merely a symbol. It's an image filled with meaning, it's not a real person. It doesn't need to be realistic, spectacular, it just needs to be there. So, um, you see that every time it's about what happens to the aging body in comparison to what happens to the young one. Well, that's something I didn't say about Simone that is quite interesting. I think the, the, part, the, the reason why Elsa Silverstein didn't get enough recognition for this part, she was not even nominated, nominated for a César when the film was very successful in France, is because the younger Simone Veil, the one who was in the camps, is played by another actress. So Elsa Silverstein actually has all the boring parts to Play, while Mario Cotillard proves the skill as a performer by being a DPF from 20 to 47 that appears at 90. Uh, I closed the, the, the bracket. Um, so those two examples, I think they, were, they are representative of the way those graphics performances are often used, at least in French cinema, in order to depict the passive last stage of the life path depicting characters that remember the important events of their past or pain for the consequences of their actions, but they actually don't do anything when they are old. Um, Alex Witzli is a remarkable exception to this trend, so I won't show you an extract because the, the film was, show, was shown before. Uh, I explained that, uh, that so, so just, it's a very peculiar uh, performance. So he's the director of the film, Alex Lutz is a famous comedian in France who is known for impersonations of female characters on TV. Uh, and he played once in a skit for the Molière Awards, uh, an aging actor, and he reprised his character for this uh, film. And so uh, he plays the role of Guy Jamais, who is like a fictitious aging crooner, some, some kind of Claude François or Herbert Léonard, who sees as someone like very cheesy that you would make fun of if you were French. Um, and so you have this young comedian playing a fake old person, playing a fake pop singer, but the dispositive he uses for that is that of a documentary. 
Um, so it's very interesting because uh, it's like a mockumentary. In fact, uh, he blurs the line between authenticity and artificiality that are at the root of this kind of performances. And so in the diegesis, you see that the film is directed by a young filmmaker uh, who is like he's convinced that he is in fact his father and he wants to make like, a TV documentary about him to get close to him. And so you have all the visual codes of TV documentaries. First person voiceover, shaky camera, scenes interrupted abruptly by jump cuts, use of archive material, uh, constant footage, and you barely see the young hero, you only hear his voice, and the aging character really takes center stage. And it's really interesting because it's the aging character and the aging performance is the center of the film, and of course the young Guy and the real Alex Lutz appears in some scenes, but they are really cameos. They are fading memories of the past, and they are only here to contribute to the success of the pastiche. Uh, so they are very, they very minutiously reproduce sorry, the aesthetics and the feel of 60s, 70s, 80s archival uh, footage. And Guy's career is not behind him. He's still active, going on tours, doing interviews, working on new recordings of his songs and films. And the film focuses on the present and not on the past. And the, the performance is really, it blends within this logic of blurring uh, the reality and the fiction. Of course, you cannot be duped into seeing that, thinking that this man is really an old man. Uh, he has a heavy makeup just like silver shines, like uh, lots of brown spots on the face, wrinkles on the forehead, hair balding, dyed white, a sinking chin, uh, sagging skin on his neck but not in a degrading way, uh, suggesting more third-age and fourth-age imaginary. What's interesting in the film is that the character, who is what we would call a Vieux uh, in French, uh, is very upfront about his use of cosmetics and uh, he dresses in an elegant way. Uh, like He betrays a willingness to maintain a young appearance, despite the fact that his hair is falling and his belly uh, is showing quite like mine. Um, but what I believe is fascinating about this performance is that he somehow manages to make the audience forget sometimes about the artificial uh, aging because of the minutia with which he performs his character's age. He has those incessant mannerisms, micro gestures that feel really authentic and really emblematic of a particular individual's way of aging. And that's what I find really interesting in the film. Like the way he rolls his tongue inside his mouth or leaves it open with his jaws spread, uh, slightly dropping on the side, uh, like on this uh, picture. He holds his cigarettes with slightly reduced fingers or lets them in his mouth, like falling down and he's trying, uh, trying to see, uh, speak. Uh, sorry. That's uh, what I told earlier about instead of excessively uh, bending down, he just shows like a rigidity of the upper part of his body, uh, and so a difficulty of mobility that is shown by the absence of mobility and now and not by like, a very showy display of disability. Um, and this richly detailed performance is enriched by the, the, the really uh, the very good writing of the dialogues, filled with old-fashioned terms, it's, for example, like he talks about his vanity case, uh, uh, stuff that I uh, wouldn't say if you were young. Uh, tons of phrases that seem really old-fashioned, authentic in some way, and very personal. And it's very interesting because if his appearance and health are starting to show signs of decline, the character remains extremely witty and insightful. You really have this effect of a young man inhabiting a old man's skin. And I think it's really like the, the you see where the performance becomes useful. You can see that there's something younger inside, but it's also typically uh, what um, as a uh, specialist of age, again, I guess it was, she calls for this kind of discrepancy between the physical appearance and the self inside the body, and it's typically what this performance allows. I think it's very interesting. Um, I am moving a bit fast. And finally, the, the eternal daughter. Um, I wanted to end this presentation with an example that matches the first uh, I talked about. So um, it's a British film from uh, 
Uh, British Art House Film Director John Ahab. It's kind of a follow up to a critic called The Souvenir. I don't know if you've seen it. But in The Souvenir, you have Tilda Swinton's daughter playing the character, like an alter ego of John Ahab, the young director, and Tilda Swinton playing her mother. And in this film that was shot during a lockdown after the, the, the death of uh, John Ahab's mother, Tilda Swinton plays mother and daughter, so Julie and Rosalind, the, the two characters of the previous film. Uh, just to explain what the film is about, it's like, uh, so Julie takes her mother to a strange hotel in the fog um, that her mother used to live in when she was a child. Uh, and so she, she, they are there together, they are supposed to have a good time, and she wants to, to research a documentary or a film about her mother. And I'm going to spoil the, the ending for you. Like, uh, the whole thing goes on, and at the end, we realize that, in fact, her mother is an hallucination, and she's already dead. Uh, so she's like spending time with the ghost uh, of her mother. And uh, what's in comparison to the other things I mentioned, it's a more less-handed approach to artificial aging. I see it's partly a question of economy because it's a low-budget film that was shot illegally during the lockdown. But it's also, we see in one scene that it was a choice that was made on purpose. I will explain. So here you see that uh, Sweden wears a white wig as supposed to mark wrinkles around her eyes and mouth, you have a, a prosthetic uh, suggesting the apparition of a turkey neck. Uh, but apart from that, most differences between mother and daughter come from costume. Like uh, Rosalind wears turtlenecks, pleated skirts, support stockings, for instance, and makeup. You have uh, not a lot of um, close ups in that scene, but you see close ups of Rosalind earlier in the film. And she's, uh, her skin is powdered with a really white foundation. And you have traces of purple and pink uh, to uh, dig her cheeks, to dig her eyes, and stuff like that. But it's quite discreet, actually. And, uh, like, uh, it's very different if you've seen Tilda Swinton aged in a very Budapest hotel or in the Snow Piazza. It's, like, it's really more subtle than in those films. And you see that um, I think that the way she acts is really above all with her voice. Like, especially with the way her speech is punctuated by those incongruous pauses or repetitions in the sentences uh, she makes. Like, if you can think of a nice way to say it, I think it would be wonderful that she speaks like that. That's how you can tell the difference also between the younger and the, the old uh, Tita Sultan. Um, what I find interesting is that, uh, of course, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, like it helps individualizing the, the character, but throughout the film, we show we are shown glimpses of an image. We see just like um, Julie's hand holding a very wrinkled old hand. And we don't understand where this image comes from. And at the very end, when we understand that the mother is in, his, in fact dead, we are shown this image of her on her deathbed, this time with a very spectacular, spectacular aging makeup. And it's quite interesting because this image of decay is seemingly held uh, back from the film, as well as from Julie's consciousness, the memory of her mother that she wants to keep, uh, her as a character and the director maybe as well. Uh, what she wants to remember is not a picture of death and the perpetuity, it's the importance of the singular relationship that existed between them. And at the same time, of course, the, the film negotiates this co-presence of two iterations of the same body in two different parts, and while they are kept in almost always different frames, their physical resemblance and the circulation of jewelry, of uh, accessories that they have matching glasses, uh, or they are like pearl earrings that move from mother to daughter. So it is suggested that they are, they are in some way the same person. And the, the last conversation is very interesting because it indicates that the mother's apparition is not only for the daughter a way to grieve, but also a manner to reflect on her own aging. And as she's entering an old age herself, Tita Swinton and Joanna Hogg at 63, she turns to this figure, who is a mirror of what Julie will become very soon, but also a testimony of what she never was, because she's not a mother. And um, she's haunted by the perspective of growing lonely into old age without a daughter to take care of her the way she took care of her own mother. And so 
it's very interesting, you see, because we come back to the, the first scene I showed you, and then we showed old age depicted as a figure of otherness, but the threat of the horrors to come uh, for uh, Miyagos uh, uh, in uh, X, and in uh, the Elton of Daughter, it's the opposite. Old age is not depicted as a distinct, separate time of life synonymous with death and decrepitude. Uh, the sweetheart's artificial age body is a reassuring, a mispresence, a friendly face, and an alter ego. It's some kind of guide uh, towards old age. And I, well, that's how I wanted to end it, showing you that um, despite their excessive nature and insistence on those biological aspects of aging, those imaginary uh, configurations in which a younger and a older version of the same body can cohabitate on screen also produce a lot of things to think about and alternative ways of um, uh, considering uh, our becoming whole. That's all. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for this extremely rich and, and nuanced uh, presentation, which uh, through the four example actually showed us a, a, a wide spectrum of possible applications of the basic techniques of artificially aging an actor um, that, that you showed in, in the introduction. And, and uh, you know, the, the home is actually on several levels a quite impressive illustration of ageist biases. Yeah. You know, where, where age is, is, as you wonderfully paraphrased it, uh, shown to be some kind of punishment for excessive living. And uh, then the comparison with Simone Weil film and the two actresses also shows us that someone who uh, plays the same character at all different age stages gets more recognition as a young actress than a slightly older actress. I, I think that was innocent, maybe 15 years old. Um, and so the older actor is basically ignored because she doesn't cover the full spectrum and also because she's older playing even older. And so what, what we see a play here are some age biases to which this obviously is my counterpoint. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for, for uh, illustrating uh, the wide variety of valences that the application of some basic it was a, an extremely nuanced presentation, and I think we have a lot to think about. There will be a lot of really interesting questions that were answered by the presentation and also raised by it. So uh, I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion in the project or in other venues. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.